so, um, yeah, so I really don't have any announcements today. We had interesting discussion in the chat. Uh, in case anyone needs to know, the important aspect from the chat is that apparently Tim Hortons roll up the rim to win. Everyone is a winner. So uh, just take that under advisement. We got the statement from at least two people who have confirmed that. So that's it in terms of announcements. Uh, unless anyone has any questions uh, related to the course material, not related to uh, the random discussions we were having. Any questions on what we've covered thus far? All right, so where we are at in terms of the course material is um, we're probably just going to finish off chapter 12 today, given what happened in the other class, and then next day we will start chapter 14. Um, on the slightly humorous side of this, I was making the lecture notes for chapter 14, and while I have not made the PowerPoint slides and the like, I was sitting there going, I actually wrote this up at some point in time in this past. That's, you know, uh, colligative properties is what we're going to be covering and the like. And I'm like, I wrote this up. I wrote this up. And there I found it. Yeah, a decade ago, I actually wrote this material for exploring chemistry. And uh, I just really had to go look in the book. And I'm like, oh, I already did all the figures and the like. So, um, but anyway, it's all going to be available to you in the next day or so. Uh, the final bit of course material for chapter 14 and away we go. We're just going to finish off chapter 12 today. Last day we uh, were looking at uh, properties associated with liquids and with regards to liquids we had two types of interaction that control the properties of the liquid. The cohesive interactions which occur within the molecule and bind the molecules of the liquid together and the adhesive interactions with the environment. Sometimes they're weaker, as in common interactions with uh, the air, and sometimes they're stronger or weaker if you have interactions with the wall. Those interactions dictate how the liquid interacts with its surroundings, um, and you could have wetting to surfaces that have similar uh, intermolecular uh, strength uh, processes when the bonds you form are of similar to the cohesive interactions, or beating when the interactions with the, the surroundings are weaker and uh, the cohesive interactions are the do stronger dominant interaction. We looked at some examples of this. Uh, surface tension provides us with the ability of some insects to walk on water, um, beating on some plants, and then treatment of wood, that type of idea. We also looked at the unique aspect that when you have a nonpolar liquid, such as gasoline, it will always wet to its environment because the cohesive interactions in the nonpolar liquid are very weak. So when they interact with either a polar or a nonpolar uh, surface, it ends up wetting to that surface. And the last thing we looked at was that of capillary action in the sense that um, as you, when there is a positive uh, adhesive interaction or even a negative adhesive interaction, this is the picture shows positive, you see, uh, you bring this, uh, the, the, the tubing or whatever you've put in there close together and that force actually acts to rise it, lift it above uh, the level of the liquid. And we looked at several examples of that and we finished off with a picture uh, that shows positive uh, cohesive interactions uh, in water, uh, adhesive interactions in water uh, with the positive meniscus and negative uh, adhesive interactions in mercury when it is in a glass tube as presented here. The last aspects of liquid uh, properties that I wanted to look at was viscosity. And viscosity is the resistance of a fluid to flow. So as a fluid moves through uh, uh, some property uh, over in a riverbed or through a pipe, um, you end up seeing resistance to flow and the property that measures that resistance is the viscosity. Viscosity is a function of the intermolecular forces, uh, relative intermolecular forces cohesive between the molecules that might resist molecules passing over one another 
and the adhesive interactions to the wall. And then the molecular size as well. Larger, bigger molecular entities are more resistant to flow. What happens is that viscosity causes the fluids to spread out and the pressure to drop in pipes. Um, if you are going to work in the oil and gas sector, you, what you'll find is that that is a major problem where they ship different fuels through the same pipe. There is a um, hundred thousand liters of diesel, then there's a break and you're sending gasoline, then you're sending a different grade of gasoline. That interface point where those two fluids are, you end up seeing a lot of mixing or fingering of the liquids into each other because some are being held back, the center is moving forward, uh, and you, if you see this picture that's presented here, one fluid's in front, another fluid's in the back, and you're going to get an overlapping uh, if you're trying, pushing that thousands of or hundreds or thousands of kilometers. It's not just in pipes that that occurs, uh, or sorry, not just in oil and gas pipes, but if you have a home that has a built-in vacuum system, you're going to see the exact same thing. The air is a fluid, um, and it flows through all of the pipes to the central canister vac. The farther you are away, the greater the drop in pressure between what the canister vac is sucking in and the pressure, uh, the vacuum component at the head of your vacuum system. So uh, upright movable vacuums are generally much more powerful uh, or uh, equally or more powerful, they're smaller than canister vacs from central vac systems. And I wanted to look at this just as a last little discussion on viscosity. Um, viscosity, I'm not spending a lot of time looking at viscosity. It's a function of temperature. For most substances, if you heat up the substance, there's more energy, the intermolecular forces are overcome, so uh, things flow easier. If you think about syrup or oil, you heat it up in a microwave, that would be syrup, and it flows a lot better. But there are other things that affect the viscosity uh, of fluids, and some fluids are, excuse me, when they are put into motion, they actually become rigid. There is a demonstration, a chemistry demonstration that involves uh, cornstarch and water, something you could do at home, you could look it up on, the, on YouTube, and when you are moving it around, it's a solid ball. You can actually, you know, well it's brittle, but you can toss it from person to person, but if you stop doing that, it just sh turns into a liquid and it just flows through your fingers. Um, quicksand is, is similar in that regard. We're going to look at uh, liquid body armor in this context. I just need to set up a few things on my computer. This should work. You just go find the video. There it is. All right. It's not just in the movies. Our men and women in blue put their lives on the line every day. And this may be their next weapon against crime. This is no normal flimsy piece of fabric. This fabric is soaked in sheer thickening fluid, which turns soft material into solid protective gear. The material becomes very hard and prevents the projectile from moving through the fabric. Rheologists who study the unusual flow of materials develop the liquid. Now it's being tested on Kevlar to make bulletproof vests as comfortable as regular clothing. A normal vest is 30, 40 layers of, of Kevlar fabric tightly packed together. We can potentially reduce the number of layers, making the material lighter, uh, more flexible, better, easier to wear. To prove the liquid's toughness, an ice pick goes right through untreated fabric. But it's stopped by fabric coated with the new liquid. As you can see, it's impossible to puncture through the material. Tiny hard particles in the liquid cluster together and jam when struck by a sudden force. Fabric coated in the liquid becomes hard enough to stop a bullet while remaining flexible. We want to improve current body armor technology, make it resistant to many different threats, not just ballistic, but also fragmentation, such as even bombs. The military plans to use the liquid technology to improve Kevlar vests for troops, a must-have body armor that saves lives. I'm Cynthia Demas reporting.
Did you see that? Just. I'm hoping that video went through. Good, thank you. Uh, Kaylin, your comment about Ublack. Ublack comes from a story, but yeah, that's that it got named that. It was a bit laggy. It, it's a little cool. There is, okay, thank you, William, for posting the link to it on, or I'll link to it online. Um, the example that was presented there, of course, is body armor using it to literally make a shirt with uh, maybe a slightly thicker shirt with two or three layers of uh, Kevlar that will stop bullets rather than a very bulky um, multi-layer, 30 to 50 layers of Kevlar to form a bulletproof, the standard typical bulletproof vest. That's one application. There are other applications of a similar uh, purpose uh, pro uh, that you applies the similar principles. This fabric is flexible. When it's moved slowly, it's flexible. It's only when it is struck that it turns rigid. And so by adjusting the properties of the fluid, you can adjust when, how much force or how much is required to turn it to a liquid. And so people are experimenting or patenting things like football uniforms. Instead of the football padding and the bulky padding associated with all of that, the uniform itself ends up becoming the structure that forms a solid shoulder piece during the interaction, the tackle, whatever the case happens to be. Someone else has already patented uh, a few years ago, actually, a helmet. But it's not a traditional helmet that you would normally wear that's big and bulky. Uh, it is quite literally a ball cap. And for, quotes, cool people who don't want to wear helmets while skateboarding, this is literally a, a cap or a ball cap that it fits, it forms nicely to your head, um, but when your head impacts the ground, it actually turns solid, and with a light, small layer of uh, padding there, it cushions the blow a little bit. Not as good as a helmet, but it's something that will protect people who, from, who aren't wearing anything. So just a few examples of uh, properties of liquids that are being adapted and modified to serve uh, purposes. And yes, William posted into the chat a link to the video on YouTube. Uh, feel free to go there and, and, and look at it if you wish. So. I want to move on to a discussion on phase changes. Um, changing phase is you know another property that we see. We can, and it happens when we add or remove heat from a substance. Specifically when we add heat, what we do is increase the temperature. That's one of the possibilities. We can increase the kinetic energy, increase the temperature of the sample that we're looking at, or we can break intermolecular bonds at a constant temperature. So that's the phase change that we're looking at here. With the common states of matter, we have solids, liquids, and gases, and there are phase change equation or terminology applied to every possibility. Realize that going in one direction is positive, going in the other direction is negative. So we generally talk about sublimation being from a solid to a gas, vaporization being from a liquid to a gas, evaporating, and probably the most confusing one is fusion going from a solid to a liquid. So while the term is fusion, it actually refers to the melting process. And the opposite of sublimation is presented here is deposition, vaporization is condensation, opposite of fusion is crystallization. Just to look at some examples of this, um, in the real world, vaporization, boiling of a kettle, you're down, you, you smell gasoline um, downwind from a gas station, or you smell perfume. All of that is the evaporation of those liquids uh, that you are smelling at some other location. Condensation, rain, um, if you take a nice hot shower, uh, you'll find a fog that is formed on your mirror. That is the water vapor condensing uh, on, on the shower, on the mirror, excuse me. Crystallization, uh, making of uh, ice cubes, freezing of water, sugar, rock candy is where you go from a liquid to a solid. Fusion is the melting process, so that would be the melting of ice, melting of wax to making candles. Uh, welding is a fusion process because you're 
ultimately heating up the metal to a melt, putting it together, and then that cooling pro sorry that 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 is the melting of the the, the metal to uh, as part of the welding process. Excuse me. Deposition is water vapor in the air condensing to form snow, not rain. Um, I have in here the data layer on a CD, but that's outdated technology, so that needs to change. But when you make integrated circuits that form your technology, that is vapor that is being deposited onto uh, the substrate to build up and form all of those integrated circuits that yeah, make up our technology. And finally, we have sublimation. <coughs> if you've lived in the northern climates for any length of time, uh, what you will find is that it will stay below zero. It'll stay 5, 10, 20 degrees below zero, but the snowpacks actually start going down. They're not melting, they're actually going straight from the solid to a gas because the humidity isn't 100%. So that water vapor, that, that vapor is coming off of the solid into the gas phase to try to increase the humidity of the, uh, in the air. Mothballs do the same thing. If you have a, a freezer burn in, uh, in, in your, something in the freezer, meat or something like that, water leaves the solid and condenses somewhere else inside the packaging that is through a sublimation process. You took enthalpy thermal chemistry in Chem 100, so I'm not gonna go into detail in this, I just wanted to bring it in to remind you of it from uh, last term. This figure is the what happens to solid, or to a substance, in this case water, as energy is added. So by definition, if there's zero energy in a substance, it's at zero Kelvin. That's one of the laws of thermodynamics, which we're going to be looking at in a bit. Um, zero energy, zero Kelvin. So when heat is being added, you're just increasing the temperature of the solid. You're heating up the ice. Until you get to 273 Kelvin, which is the melting point of ice, and you see the phase transition going from solid to liquid at the constant temperature, 273.15 Kelvin. Once it's all melted, then you heat up the liquid water until you get to 373 Kelvin, and then that water boils and evaporates to give you a gas which can then be heated. When you break, when you melt ice, you generally break about one intermolecular bond. When you vaporize water, you break all of the intermolecular bonds. And that's part of the reason why you see such a substantial difference in the amount of energy required to melt something versus evaporate it. <coughs> These are the heat capacities of solid, liquid, and gaseous uh, water. They're approximate because they are slightly temperature dependent. Uh, and uh, presented here for you know these different substances. The enthalpies of fusion, vaporization, and sublimation uh, are the horizontal lines. Sublimation isn't shown on this figure, but it uh, is generally the sum of fusion and vaporization. Enthalpy is also slightly temperature dependent. So if everything here was at 273 Kelvin, fusion plus vaporization would equal sublimation but because there is a slight variability as a function of temperature in enthalpies, um, it's not exact, but it would be if everything was at the same temperature. So, to look at vapor pressure. Vapor pressure is the partial pressure of a gaseous entity, given the symbol PA. Um, it's the partial pressure when there is an equilibrium between the liquid and when there is an equilibrium between the gas and either the liquid or solid state. So the figure shows the vapor pressure of water. It's a logarithmic scale on the vertical axis <coughs> going up by four orders of magnitude over this temperature range. Uh, and I guess my question for you is, um, have you ever heard the term, it's too cold to snow or it needs to warm up in snow. Is that something that you've heard from in, in living in the northern area, in climates, northern area? 
So a lot of people are saying yes to that. It needs to warm up to snow. It, it, the reason for this is this figure. So before I get into explaining that, let's think about really, really cold temperatures here in, well, Prince George, northern BC. When it was really cold, it was, it will always, oh, I'll use the term, be a clear sunny day, as long as there's no storm fronts coming in or whatever the case is. But if it's really cold, it will be clear blue skies, sunny, because there isn't enough water vapor in the air to actually form clouds. The partial pressure of water at minus 40 degrees is about 0.1 millimeter of mercury. That's not enough to condense and form clouds. But that increases uh, logarithmically, as presented here. And so at minus 20 degrees, it's, or about minus 18 degrees, it's up to one millimeter of mercury. That's actually still a challenge to form clouds at minus 20 degrees. But once you're up to five or eight or 10 millimeters of mercury, there's enough to form clouds and for those clouds to initiate precipitation. The reason you get major snowstorms in the range of zero to minus five degrees Celsius is because you can get more water vapor into the air and that gets you more condensation and more snow. The one caveat I have on that is that because we have moisture here that comes in off the coast, it might be minus 40 degrees at ground level, but it could actually be warmer aloft. And so sometimes you do see clouds, storm systems come in and then it actually, they're warmer, it does warm up a bit and then it starts snowing as it mixes with the cold uh, lower level air. The boiling point of water, for whatever reason, isn't on this figure, is at, of course, 100 degrees Celsius is the normal boiling point, and it occurs at 760 millimeters of mercury. We'll talk about that in a little bit. How do we calculate the vapor pressure? This very simple equation called the Antoine equation is still used by researchers um, to calculate the vapor pressure at whatever defined temperature. A, B, and C are just empirical parameters. So once you have some data, you fit the parameters A, B, and C to it, and now you can calculate the pressure. The caveat with that is that the parameters A, B, and C, while they are tabulated, they have changed over time, and different people report them in different units. Temperature is, I'm gonna say always in Kelvin, but I'm sure some data set has it in something else, but whatever. It could be in Celsius, because there's just an additive parameter to it. Um, pressure, atmospheres was much more common in the past. The parameters could give you pressures in Pascals, bar, millimeters of mercury. So you have to be aware what the parameters, how the data was fit. Was it fit to bar and Kelvin or whatever? But that's always tabulated with the Antoine parameters. If you happen to know the vapor pressure at one temperature, then you can calculate the, or estimate the vapor pressure at a nearby temperature. Nearby plus or minus 50 degrees. Clausius Clapeyron equation is more common because you don't always look up the Antoine parameters. If you want to plot it, you need that, or if you want to use it in calculations, you would use that. But Clausius Clapeyron equation is used quite commonly to figure out some properties of liquids. So what we are going to do is we're going to calculate the vapor pressure of bromine at 300 Kelvin. There are the Antoine parameters that I got off of the NIST chemistry web book. Um, and the valid range for that data set is 220 Kelvin to 331 Kelvin. Once we have that, we're going to use the clausius clapeyron equation to determine the normal boiling point of bromine. And in order to do that, you need the enthalpy of vaporization of bromine, and that is 30.9 kilojoules per mole. Okay. So the first bit was to calculate the pressure at 300 Kelvin. And we have the equation. A minus B over T plus C. And of course, our temperature 
that we want to work at is 300 Kelvin. Now, I'm not going to write out all the numbers. They're literally off of the, the table. Um, but when you plug all of those values in, you're going to get negative 0 0.4813. In order to get the actual pressure, you need to raise this to the power of 10, and you're going to find that the pressure is equal to 0 0.330, and this happens to be units of bar. All right. The second bit was to use the clausius clapeyron equation. Which is presented there. I do want to point out that the way I present this equation is slightly different than the textbook. The textbook presents it as negative delta they have a negative sign and they have this order of T1 and T2. I just by substituting the negative sign in you flip the order T1 T2 and I just prefer the equation that I've presented on the left-hand side. Now, normal boiling point is one atmosphere, and that is 1.01325 bar. Because normal all boiling points were measured under the units of atmosphere and so normal is actually a defined term in relation to boiling point. So we have natural log plugging these numbers in we were given the enthalpy of vaporization as 30.9 times 10 to the 3, looking at the units, joules per mole. And the value of R is the one that gets rid of the units and gives us what I want, 8.314 joules per mole Kelvin. Good. And then when we plug their temperature in here, 1 over 300 Kelvin minus 1 over T1. With regards to units, lots of things cancel. Except that really can't cancel because we need it for the units. In the context of the mathematics, that works out to be 3.017 times 10 to the minus 4 with units of 1 over Kelvin. So can people just plug that into their calculators? It's slightly more complicated and want to make sure that you're able to do this. Tell me what T1 is. What do you get as a value for T1? Good. 
Christian gets 330 Kelvin. Other people get something the same or something different. Anarchy gets the same thing, which is very, very surprising because I also get 330 Kelvin. And that is an estimate of the boiling point of bromine. Now, if you were to go and look it up, the actual boiling point is 331 Kelvin. So we are very close. We're only off by about 0.3%. Uh, and the, and the error is due to the, different, the slight change in the enthalpy of vaporization. This theory, this equation would be perfect if the enthalpy of vaporization uh, was a constant it's almost constant, it has a slight variation. So, away we go, boiling point for me. Good. Does anyone have any questions on that? All right, so we define the boiling point is the temperature where the liquid vapor pressure equals the external pressure. And I'm actually gonna right now add just a tiny bit to this slide because I wanna be, oh, I can't. Um, there's too much data on the slide. The normal boiling point, the normal boiling point is when the liquid vapor pressure equals one atmosphere. That is how we define the standard or normal boiling point of a liquid. Does anyone happen to know how boiling point changes with altitude and how does this affects cooking? Does the boiling point go up or down with increasing altitude? Yes isn't an answer. It's either going to be up or down. It increases or decreases. The boiling point goes up with I increasing altitude. Altitude increased, boiling point goes down. Yes, that's better. Um, as you increase in altitude, the external pressure goes down. And I don't have a figure of this here. Uh, it's in my gases unit. Um, but at an elevation of 670 meters, the average atmospheric pressure is 0.94 bar. At sea level, it's one bar or 1.01 bar, one atmosphere. But as you go up in elevation, the average atmospheric pressure goes down to the point that by the time you get into space, the pressure is, is zero. So, and at 0.94 bar, water boils at about 97 degrees Celsius. Mexico City, which is two kilometers in altitude, a uh, barometric pressure of 0.78 bar on average, uh, water boils at 93 degrees Celsius. Prince George is slightly lower than Edmonton. It's about 570 meters. Um, and at 570 meters, it's about 0.95 and water boils at 97, 98 degrees Celsius. So we still can measure it here in Prince George, uh, that there is a slight decrease in the boiling point. What happens is that this affects the cooking process because cooking is expected to occur at 100 degrees Celsius. If you're actually not at 100 degrees Celsius, you're at a lower temperature, there's less energy available for the cooking process to occur. So protein denaturation takes longer um, for cooking like that. And because it takes longer, more water actually evaporates. So in order to cook foods to the same consistency, you want to increase the cooking times, increase the liquid volume, because more water is going to evaporate because it takes longer to cook. 
And also, because there's less of an external pressure, you decrease the amount of baking powder, baking soda, because those things are present to make the food fluffy and rise, while if there's less external pressure, it just rises too much. So by decreasing it, you, excuse me, uh, end up getting the same consistency that you would at various different altitudes. This is a figure that looks at vapor pressure from the context of wanting to produce the same vapor pressure uh, independent of temperature, or approximately the same. Um, you can look at those four substances up at the top. We're going to get rid of propane for just a second. Butane, isobutane, butene, and isobutene um, all have boiling points around, well, between zero and minus 12 degrees Celsius. The composition of lighters changes depending on where you're at. If you are in a warmer climate, you're going to put stuff in the lighter, the, the, the combustible fluid, that has a higher boiling point, butane, butene, isobutene in the lighter, because you want a certain gas pressure inside and a gas volume being given off. However, a lighter made with those three chemicals would not work really well in northern climates, so other chemicals needed to be added. Butane, isobutane, for example, uh, allows a lighter to work better at, at colder climates. It's still, if you're at minus 20, minus 30, you're warming a lighter up in your hand in order to get the lighter to work. Now, Camping fuel, which is the Brunton container there, if you use pressurized camping fuel, actually comes in a summer and winter version. The summer version is more of the uh, chemicals that are present there, boiling min around minus one, minus 10. But if you're gonna do winter camping, you can't keep the thing warm, so there is other propane added to actually make it function at colder temperatures. So uh, if you use the wrong one at the wrong temperature, and I know, um, I know crazy people who camp in the winter, I don't anymore, um, but if they don't care, they end up taking the fuel canister in the sleeping bag with them to keep it warm for them such that when they get up in the morning, they can actually cook their breakfasts. So there's ways around it, or you could just buy the right fuel for your camping expeditions. Right. We've talked thus far about solids a little bit, liquids and gases predominantly, the idea of vaporization and the like. To bring all of this together, we have the uh, concept of a phase diagram. What it does is it presents the stable state of matter as a function of temperature and pressure. And I'm going to skip over this right now just to go and look at a phase diagram. Then I will back up to that previous slide to discuss it and give you time to write it down. So this is your typical phase diagram. Um, oh, uh, there is, <coughs> excuse me, solids, liquids, and gases. And we'll talk about supercritical fluids in a bit. Um, but there are typically three lines. There is a sublimation line between gas and solid. There is a vaporization line between gas and liquid. And then there is a fusion line between the solid and liquid. So we have these processes here. I'm going to go back to the previous slide, and then we'll come back and look at this in more detail. So one of the features of phase diagrams and of chemical entities is that there's only one state of matter stable for a given temperature and pressure. When you are along the sublimation, vaporization, or fusion curves, there are two phases that are in equilibrium. So along the sublimation, it's solid gas that are in equilibrium, etc. There is one point on the phase diagram in which three phases are in equilibrium, and that position is called the triple point. And finally, above a certain temperature and pressure, called the critical point, liquids are not actually stable. And we actually introduce a new state of matter called supercritical fluids.
So to go back and look at that phase diagram again, um, sublimation, vaporization, and fusion lines are presented there. Those are equilibrium conditions. If you happen to be at that temperature and pressure, uh, I can actually just point your options, uh, felt tip pen. If I'm sitting, I'll just do it over here, at this temperature and pressure, and I'm just discovered I can draw on this. Um, if you're sitting right there, you are at equilibrium, the phase change between liquid and solid carbon dioxide. Okay. Um, if you are anywhere else inside, then your state of matter is solid CO2, solid gas, whatever it happens to be. Or not solid gas, sorry. Gas is CO2. The triple point for carbon dioxide is at 217 Kelvin and 5.3 bar. It's actually a doable temperature or a doable condition that we can, in a laboratory, create supercritical CO2 quite easily. The interesting thing is that the pressure on Earth is one bar. And so one bar and 300 Kelvin means that the standard state of carbon dioxide is that of gas, of course. Um, but when we do make solid CO2, the process that is going to occur is that of sublimation. Okay, we're going to go straight from solid CO2 to gaseous CO2. Uh, and finally, the critical point at 304 Kelvin and 74-ish bar uh, is the maximum temperature and pressure in which liquid and gas can exist as separate entities. The idea of supercritical fluid is it's a different state of matter. It's another state of matter. Okay, you uh, put it in their line with plasma. If you uh, remember that from high school, took it in physics, they introduced you the concept of plasma as being another state of matter. Supercritical fluid is another state of matter as well. Uh, and it has unique properties, some properties of liquids, some properties of gases, but it is a unique state, just like plasma. That phase diagram is when you have the, the, your quintessential phase diagram. It gets more complicated the more you study things. So there's only ever going to be one gaseous state. There's only ever going to be one liquid state. But there can be multiple solid states. And here we have carbon existing presented with three sta solid states of carbon, graphite, diamond, and metallic. The graphite diamond line, this line right here, okay, that is well defined and well studied um, in science. However, the line between diamond and metallic is not that well studied, and there would be another triple point, and it would be who knows where it's at. It's just somewhere there. Not well studied, not well defined. The interesting aspect about carbon is that, of course, it's solid under ambient conditions, one bar pressure and, you know, a couple hundred, 300 Kelvin. But we find diamonds in the Earth. They're not supposed to exist on Earth. Um, what happens is diamonds are formed in generally active volcanoes. The extreme heat and pressure in the active volcano um, crushes the carbon melts it most likely, and when it crystallizes out, it converts into diamonds. The ability of a diamond to convert to graphite is has a very high barrier. If you remember our discussion on kinetics, there is a barrier between the reactants and products. Well, here, diamond is high energy, graphite is low energy, it would like to go down to the low energy state, but the barrier is just too high. It can't overcome the barrier. So you end up with what is known as metastable diamond um, coming down here. You can mine diamonds from, the, uh, from volcanic cores, which are called kimberlite mines. So you can mine them from there, and they you know, will stay in their diamond form. That said, I don't have the video with me here, but if you go on to YouTube or the like, you can actually find pictures of people who have lots of money and are a little bit crazier than I am 
oh wait, they're probably not crazier than I am, but I don't have the money to do it, um, that are actually taking diamonds and burning them in liquid oxygen. Um, you can actually burn diamond, one expensive barbecue, uh, but it, it, it behaves like coal does. Under the right conditions, it will convert to carbon dioxide. Uh, not the greatest use of a diamond, I just point out. All right, so phase diagram here, uh, graphite, diamond, and the like. The other phase diagram I want to look at is as you study things more and more and more, you find that there's you know nuances. This is the phase diagram for water, and again, gas and liquid. There's only one of each state, but there are more than 15 known states of solid water or some version of ice. Under normal ambient conditions, that's right down here, we're dealing with ice one. That's what we skate on, that's what we slide our cars on in the winter time. Um, but if you drop the pressure or dro drop the temperature or increase the pressure, you see different forms of ice being formed. And the reason why we kind of know that there's different forms is because this blue line isn't a nice smooth curve as we see here. For carbon dioxide, it is believed that there's only one solid state of carbon dioxide because that fusion melting line is smooth. Here, there's discontinuities, which suggests that there's more than one state of solid carbon, more than one state of solid water. Okay, we're running out of time, but I do want to finish this one slide off. Um, yeah, we actually did the second question, what conditions are required for diamonds to form? We spent a little bit of time looking at that. But in the first question, carbon dioxide fire extinguishers are filled to a pressure of 58 bar at room temperature. What is the dominant state of CO2 inside the fire extinguisher? The second question is that discharging the extinguisher cools the gas. What may also happen during the discharge? And so go back to the CO2 line. 58, just one, is about right there, 58 bar. And if I translate that over to 300 Kelvin, I'm sitting at a point of about right here. So inside of the fire extinguisher is liquid carbon dioxide in equilibrium with gas. It's basically, we're at this point on the liquid gas uh, vaporization curve. When we discharge the fire extinguisher, the pressure drops, but also the temperature drops. So we see it doing, and that's just a bad piece of whatever. Uh, we see the temperature dropping. So initially, the pressure drops, and of course, gas is being discharged. But if the temperature drops as well, it is possible that we send this over into a point where you start seeing not excuse me, not sublimation, but deposition, you start seeing the gaseous or liquid CO2 cooling down and forming white uh, solid carbon dioxide that is being ejected from the fire extinguisher. That answers those questions there, and we've already talked about the last one. Does anyone have any questions on this material uh, before we close for today? Altitude, okay, I'm just reading the chat comments here. Insert Minecraft reference here. I'm not sure about that. I should ask my son about it. No, okay, so the question is, can we have another triple point? Uh, not known to science. Is it possible that two solids come together at the exact same temperature and pressure as liquid and gas? Not likely, um, which is why if we look at the triple points here for carbon, um, the different triple point between diamond, graphite, and liquid carbon um, exists here. Is it possible that, if, that the metallic comes off like that? It is. Is it likely? Not very. It's very much more likely that there's another triple point right here, and we end up having metallic, diamond, and liquid 
uh, having their own point. So getting a quadruple point, not the, the most likely uh, thing. Do we know what topics are on the next uh, midterm? Um, yes, we're going to stop somewhere in early chapter 13. So um, I'll let you know next week what's going to be on the, the midterm. But all of chapters 12, 14, and maybe a little bit of 13 is going to be on the midterm. Okay? All right. If there's no other questions, if there are, just type them in and I'll answer them. Otherwise, we'll uh, talk to everybody on Monday. Have a great weekend. And let me know which Tim Hortons you work at. Or maybe not, as the case may be. Oh, you've already left. Whatever. No big deal. All right.